Yeah, you want to take a picture? Uh, today we're going to get into population evolution and Freddie Weinberg for our lab today, which is lab 23. Lab 24, this is going to be really important, is you're going to water bulk trays, but only spray your variable groups with gibberellic acid. So you want to make sure you're only spraying that one tray, non-sprayable trays. Homework, you'll finish up lab 23. I do have a bunch of resources on Canvas for Hardy Weinberg. I'm going to go over it in class. I'm going to go over it in lecture. Um, hopefully you'll get it down, but there are other resources as well. And I do some examples of Hardy Weinberg's on Canvas too. Um, this is going to be really important to know and understand, so make sure your brains are checked in today. There will definitely be a Hardy Weinberg on the next exam, so you want to make sure that you know and understand what you're doing. And then keep working on your objectives. And then this is the rest of the unit. We have one more week, and then your exam will be on Tuesday, February 6th. We're almost in February. We're getting there. All right, let's talk. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Wants to I've been sending a message like probably about twice a week to you all with this in there too. So if you're not connected to Canvas to check your messages, make sure you are because that would be really helpful to you. All right, let's talk about organism evolution and how this happens. Um, typically when we're talking about organism evolution, we're talking about it on a population level. Organisms don't evolve. Like I can't just be like, I'm going to evolve into a dinosaur. I can't do that. The genes that I have, the inheritance I've gotten from my biological mom and bi biological dad, it's already set. I can't change that. Evolution is based in genetics, and genetics, when we have changes in our genes from parent organism to offspring, we call those mutations. Can you forcibly mutate your DNA just willing it to happen? No, I mean, you might have some things that might happen throughout our life that some cells might mutate because of UV rays, for example. And those cells that already have the genes for the possibility of having cancer, given a certain environment like UV rays, you may get skin cancer in those particular cells. But we can't just be like, I'm gonna do this with my genes. We can't do that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about organism evolution in terms of framing it as you either have advantageous traits or you don't, and you are either therefore selected for in the environment or you're not. And then we have to think about another important factor and evolution is mating. That as a population, in order for us to keep making generations and keep our population going, we have to have some kind of reproduction. So that those who have advantageous traits or are favored in the environment have an easier time surviving and they are often chosen as mates for those advantageous traits and they pass on those advantageous traits to the next generation. So as an individual, it's just about survival and what you have given the environment. Okay, so again, evolution is a product of a population, not of an individual. What is a population? We're a population. We are members of the same species. You've been looking at different species in lab. We are homo sapiens. We live in the same place at the same time. So if you have family that lives in the Philippines, they are not part of your population. They're part of your family, but they're not part of your physical population. Our population is those kinds of individuals that have the same genetic traits. We'll talk about reproductive isolation next week and we live in the same place at the same time. We are the population. Within a population, there's a variety of genes or traits that that population exhibits. We call that the gene pool. 
There are all the possible variations in our different characteristics or traits. Variation, we look at as our genes or alleles. An allele is a gene, but it's all of the different variants of that characteristic. So if we're talking about, let's say, eye color in humans, and just to make it like simply based on color, because we can have striping and flecks and rings and all that. But if we're just talking about eye color, we can have brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes. So we have those three different kinds or alternates of that trait, and those are based in different alleles for that trait. They are alternate versions of the traits of a characteristic. In humans, we have 46 pairs of chromosomes. We have a pair Y. Where do each of the individual chromosomes come from? Who do they come from? Your yeah, your parents. So we have a pair, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes to make 46 total chromosomes. We have one of each pair comes from biological mom, one comes from biological dad. 23 from sperm, 23 from egg, come together to make your 46 chromosomes in your cells. We call these homologous chromosomes because, again, there's that H-O-M-O, -O, which means same or similar, is they have the same gene banding patterns, but the genes themselves may show different alleles for the traits. So here, for example, our mom and our dad have given us the same alleles for this trait, same alleles for this trait, but here, biological mom gave us this allele and biological dad gave us a different allele for this same trait. So an allele is an alternate form of a gene for a given trait. Gives you variation in that trait. Remember, pair of homologous chromosomes, one from bio mom, one from bio dad. And when we are taking a look at genes and inheritance in a population, one of the things that we can do to show that evolution has happened in a population is we can look at complete dominance inheritance for a pair of genes, and we can see, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a second, what are the percentage of the dominant alleles in the population right now? What's the percentage of the recessive alleles in the population now? And then we can come back 100 generations, 1,000 generations, and we can calculate that or get the data for percent of dominant, percent of recessive alleles, and see if those percentages have changed. And if they have changed, it gives us evidence that evolution has occurred in that population. One of the things about when we're talking about complete dominance is you have, I'll get into that in a, in a, in a bit. I'll come back to that, but let's go for it. So we can, just like we looked at in lab last week, how we looked at homologous structures, skulls, embryos. We know we can look at biochemistry. We can look at fossils like we did in lab. We also can use our genetics to track is evolution happening in a population over time. So there's so many ways that we can study evolution. Again, if those allele frequencies change over time, it supports, gives us data to show that evolution has happened in that population. We have changes in what traits are favored now, what traits are favored in the future, shows that the selection by nature and mates has changed what is favorable in the population over time. This term frequency, think about that as percentage that we're looking at when we're talking about frequencies, we're looking at the percentages of dominant percentages of recessive alleles over time. Allele frequency, again, we're looking at what do the individual allele percentages look like now? What 
do they look like in the future? For example, if we are looking at 100 P plans, so remember that there's two alleles for every trait because you get one allele from bio mom, one from bio dad. So if you have 100 plants and there are two alleles for every trait, 100 times two gives us 200 alleles. If we're looking at the gene that controls flower color, and if 50 alleles of those 200 code for white flowers, what is the frequency of that allele in the population? So some of you get that in your head already, you can do that now on your own if you wanna grab your phone and calculate that out, that's fine. But do a little equation. You're thinking, how do I figure out percentage? Think about that for a second. What's the frequency? Which letter? C. Good, C. So the frequency is 0.25. We take five, or sorry, 50, 500, 50, divide that by 200 individuals. 50 alleles for white flower color divided by 200 alleles total gives us 0.25. We want to convert that to a percentage. We times this by 100. This moves the decimal place two places to the right, and we get 25% white flower color alleles. So we have evidence to show that living things do change over time. We talked a lot about natural selection in the past week. We're gonna look at it in a little more detail of a couple of different mechanisms that happen in terms of natural selection in addition to what happens in the environment that may influence that. Okay, so what is mutation? Is that anytime you have an alternate form of a gene or allele that is caused by a mutation. Hypothetically, you have one allele for a trait, and then over time in that population, boop, mutation happens, it's favored, it stays in the population. We could have alleles that are selected out of the population, other alleles that get selected back into the population. So the alleles that are found in a population over, if we're talking about like thousands or millions of years, can drastically change based on what alleles or traits are selected for given the current environment. So a mutation by definition just means a change in the DNA sequence. The genes change by mistake. Remember that when the parents, when sperm are being made and egg are being made, that the parent, they can't be like, okay, come on, egg, I want you to contain these mutations. Come on, can we force that to happen? Can we will it? Can we direct it? No, we can't, right? So that big volume of DNA found in the egg or the sperm being copied so fast, that quickness, it definitely promotes mutations to occur. So we get mutations just by chance. Remember that. You might wanna write that in big letters right here. Mutations happen by chance or accident. Because the DNA gets copied so quickly, mistakes get made. Very important to remember that when we're talking about evolution is that organisms and cells cannot will certain traits to pop up in the population Certain traits pop up by accident. Mutations occur by chance or by accident. So pivotal. Oh, it's not on the semester. Okay, so there are checkpoints that try and cannot uh, try and correct any mutations that might occur. But even those checkpoints, there's only like three of them. And there's again a huge volume of information that's copied from the parent cell to the daughter cell and still mutations get by. When mutations occur from the parent cell to the daughter cells, 
specifically most important in evolution when we're talking about the reproductive cells, when we're talking about egg and sperm, because that goes on to an offspring or an individual. Mutations can occur in the copy of, let's say, in our eye cells, that when a cell starts to break down and it gets old, then that cell starts to die off, two new cells are created to replace that cell. Let's say in those daughter cells there, via mitosis, that in our eye, if we get a cell that codes for blindness, one cell out of, let's say, a million, is that a big deal in our eye? If we have one cell that codes for blindness and the rest of them are working fine? No, right? One of a million. That cell, okay, so that cell doesn't produce the proteins and all of the things to make you see correctly. It's not producing those proteins, but all the other cells have enough to keep your eyesight healthy. So it's not a big deal necessarily when a body cell has a mutation that makes it not function well but it is a big deal when a mutation occurs in sperm or egg because that results in an individual. So when we're talking about DNA, have this process of going from DNA gets translated to RNA and RNA gets transcripted into a protein. Transcription and translation. What this means going through this process is that the DNA is the instructions. for everything that's important in your cells or your body. So whatever cellular level we're, we're talking about is that our DNA is the instructions for everything important in your cells, your tissues, your organs, your body. When we're talking about the final product, and I'm gonna say protein. Because that's where we learn it, is that DNA to RNA to protein, but protein is just a placeholder for Everything that's important in your cells, your tissues, your organs, your body. But the proteins can go off into other metabolic pathways to become lipids, um, tissues, other proteins. So these proteins that are originally made, they go off into metabolic pathways and they become everything in your body. And everything in our body is not only protein, we have all kinds of other stuff. So this process here, the idea is, is that if you have
have mutations in your DNA to your RNA, you can get a mistake there. So it's going to change the important stuff that you're making. And if you get another mistake that happens here or mistakes here, it's gonna make more changes here. And then also, even before this, DNA replication, you can get some mistakes that happen into here. So there's a lot of different places that you can get changes from the instructions to all the important stuff in the long run. When we're talking about these changes, we're talking about changes in the appearance. And when we're talking about appearance, we're talking about how your cells function. We're talking about how your cells look or how your traits look. And we're talking about also our behaviors. Our behaviors are based in our DNA too. So we have a lot of things that can be translated from a mutation in the DNA to the overall how the organism looks, how it physiologically functions, and how that organism acts or behaves. So a lot, you can kind of think now like, whoa, yeah, there's a lot that can go wrong. Mutations do not happen in anticipation of the environment changing. You can't will your cells to mutate in certain ways. They just happen. So during transcription, the the blood copy that the RNA function that you can just have in your also for the protein to get during transcription to make it. You can. Yeah. So you can have mistakes at you can have mistakes at either place here, but you can also, and then remember too, so that not only, you know, you could have mistakes in the copying of the DNA, and you could have mistakes in the DNA making the transcript of the RNA, and then you could have a mistake in the RNA translating into the protein. So you've got a lot of different places, not just the copying of the DNA before you go into cell reproduction or the copying of a cell, but this can cause mistakes too, or mutations. Yeah, good question. Mutations happen by chance, it's just an accident. I'm gonna guess none of you, when you're doing your work for college or your job or you're doing something at home, when you make a mistake, you don't do it on purpose, right? You make a mistake when you're driving and you pull into a next lane, you're not doing that person, I'm gonna hit this car, right? That's just a chance mistake. You just do it by accident. It's the same way that this all happens, is that all of this, cell's doing its best. And okay, but all set, I don't, I don't know what's going on this semester. Okay, so there are checkpoints that try and connect, that try and correct any mutations that might occur, but even those checkpoints, there's only like three of them. And there's again, a huge volume of information that's copied from the parent cell to the daughter cell and still mutations get by. When mutations occur from the parent cell to the daughter cells, specifically most important in evolution when we're talking about the reproductive cells, we're talking about egg and sperm because that goes on to an offspring or an individual. Mutations can occur in the copy of, let's say, in our eye cells, that when a cell starts to break down and it gets old, then that cell starts to die off, two new cells are created to replace that cell. Let's say in those daughter cells there, via mitosis, that in our eye, if we get a cell that codes for blindness, one cell out of, let's say, a million, is that a big deal in our eye? If we have one cell that codes for blindness and the rest of them are working fine? No, right? One of a million. That cell, okay, so that cell doesn't produce the proteins and all of the things to make you see correctly. It's not producing those proteins, but all the other cells have enough to keep your eyesight healthy. So it's not a big deal necessarily when a body cell has a mutation that makes it not function well but it is a big deal when a mutation occurs in sperm or egg because that results in an individual. So when we're talking about DNA, We have 
through this process of going from DNA gets translated to RNA and RNA gets transcripted into a protein. What this means going through this process is that the DNA is the instructions for everything that's important in your cells or your body. So whatever cellular level we're, we're talking about is that our DNA is the instructions for everything important in your cells, your tissues, your organs, your body. When we're talking about the final product, and I'm going to say protein. Because that's where we learn it, is that DNA to RNA to protein. But protein is just a placeholder for... everything that's important in your cells, your tissues, your organs, your body. But the proteins can go off into other metabolic pathways to become lipids, um, tissues, other proteins. So these Those proteins that are originally made, they go off into metabolic pathways and they become everything in your body. And everything in our body is not only protein, we have all kinds of other stuff. So this process here, the idea is, is that if you have you have mutations in your DNA to your RNA, you can get a mistake there. So it's going to change the important stuff that you're making. And if you get another mistake that happens here or mistakes here, it's going to make more changes here. And then also, even before this, DNA replication, you can get some mistakes that happen into here. So there's a lot of different places that you can get changes from the instructions to all the important stuff in the long run. When we're talking about these changes, we're talking about changes in the appearance. And when we're talking about appearance, we're talking about how your cells function. We're talking about how your cells look or how your traits look. And we're talking about also our behaviors. Our behaviors are based in our DNA too. So we have a lot of things that can be translated from a mutation in the DNA to the overall how the organism looks, how it physiologically functions, and how that organism acts or behaves. So a lot, you can kind of think now like, whoa, yeah, there's a lot that can go wrong. Mutations do not happen in anticipation of the environment changing. You can't will your cells to mutate in certain ways. They just happen. Yeah. 
So you can have mistakes out, you can have mistakes at either place here, but you can also, and then remember too, So that not only, you know, you could have mistakes in the copying of the DNA, and you could have mistakes in the DNA making the transcript of the RNA, and then you can have a mistake in the RNA translating into the protein. So you've got a lot of different places, not just the copying of the DNA before you go into cell reproduction or the copying of a cell, but this can cause mistakes too, or mutations. Yeah, good question. Mutations happen by chance, it's just an accident. I'm gonna guess none of you, when you're doing your work for college or your job or you're doing something at home, when you make a mistake, you don't do it on purpose, right? You make a mistake when you're driving and you pull into a next lane, you're not doing it on purpose, you're like, I'm gonna hit this car, right? That's just a chance mistake, you just do it by accident. It's the same way that this all happens, is that all of this, cell's doing its best. And thank you, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Genes are in our gene pool, so those advantageous traits, the non-advantageous traits, all the traits are in the gene pool, all the genes that the population displays or has. So next week, you're going to analyze, we won't do it today, but uh, Tuesday, you're going to analyze your bacterial plates that you laid out. Huge, enormous, important area of research is studying what kind of mutations do bacteria have to make them resistant to our current antibiotics. And as they become resistant to more and more of our current antibiotics, that's bad news for us. So we need new antibiotics. But bacteria, they do this process really, really, really fast. So the potential for them to make mistakes that results in new traits making them resistant to antibiotics that we have is pretty high because they can reproduce so quickly. So what you did in lab was you're going to take a look at, you swiped this and after we put it right now, your plates are in the incubator. So the E. coli that you swiped with, you're going to see some growth on your plates. So here, what this experiment is showing is that the auger has antibiotic already inside of it. So they're growing on antibiotic, whereas you used six different kinds of antibiotics. Your auger was playing and you put the bacteria on there. So this auger has antibiotic. You swipe them and you end up with, oh, so wait, no, wait. So here's your bacterial colony, then they put the antibiotic on there. That's what this is, the antibiotic. They put it on there and then they see after it incubates who survives. And so on each of these plates, you're getting just four colonies of all of these original colonies that you put on there or that grew on there. So here's what we know, is we know that these ones here have the advantageous traits given this specific antibiotic. Could we put another antibiotic on there that might kill them? So just because a bacteria a colony has resistance to that kind of antibiotic doesn't mean it has resistance to all antibiotics. Well, let's take a look at this question. A bacterial allele conveys resistance to the antibiotic streptomycin. Let's go through these one by one before you get the answer and see if you got it. So is this always beneficial to the bacteria cell? No, because what if it's not in the presence of streptomycin? No big deal. What if it's in the presence of another kind of antibiotic like penicillin? 
Well, it's not beneficial in that case. Is beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin? That sounds really good, right? You've got a gene for resistance to this particular antibiotic, so in the presence of it, you're like, woo, you survived this antibiotic. Is neutral, is neither beneficial nor detrimental to the cell. It's, got, it's definitely got an advantage given this scenario. Is beneficial to the cell in the absence of streptomycin? I mean, it's there, right? But it's just like if streptomycin comes along, woo! If it doesn't, it's not special at all. It's always detrimental to the cell. No, that's just dumb. Okay, so hopefully you all chose B. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics Where do they get it? Where do they get the resistance to antibiotics? So let's look through these. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics because they are in the presence of the antibiotic and mutate to become better suited to living in the environment. Can they will themselves to mutate in a given environment? No. So that, even though it sounds like, hmm, that's, that sounds pretty good, it's a nice long answer, no. This means that once they encounter the antibiotic, they're like, come on, let's get resistance to it. You can't do that, you can't will a mutation. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics because the antibiotic causes a mutation. Does the environment cause the mutations? I mean, on a rare occasion, but mostly our mutations when we're talking about evolution happen in this process. So no, the environment does not cause the mutation. This is no, 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 no. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics because some of them just happen to have, I like the wording, happen to have a mutation to the antibiotic already. I like that. They survive and they pass on those advantageous genes to their offspring. How's that one sound? Oh, that sounds good, right? And then because the environment influences the bacteria to have a mutation, this one is similar to that one. No, no, the environment does not cause these mutations. Right, so that's, that's like outside of evolution. That's not an evolutionary, like you can certainly like, like let's say it's, you're talking about skin cancer, right? That you have by chance already the genes to get skin cancer. Then the environment happens and you can like keep yourself protected from that environment, right? By wearing sunscreen and hats and staying out of the sun. We all could do that, but those of us who just happen to have already by chance the gene for getting cancer, it's when we go into that environment, so it's like this, when you go into that environment, then you show that issue. But if you're not in the presence of sunlight, you don't show that issue, right? So this is all already <laughs> happening. Yeah, yeah, so it's, that's environmental, that's natural selection happening. That's one of the things that when we're studying diseases now is that they really think that you are what we call predisposed to certain diseases and when you put yourself in that environment, then that disease shows. Just like diabetes, for example, you may have, you might see in families and perhaps in one of your families or a family you know that a lot of people have diabetes. As they get older, they might have that type two diabetes and that's because they have the genetics already in them and given the poor eating habits over time and the lack of exercise, they show the disease. So that is a nature working on the genes. Yeah, good question. All right, so my, and the environment only selects for those who already have those traits. And just like your example with a certain kind of cancer that you put yourself or you happen to be in a certain environment and you just happen to already have this gene by chance for a certain disease, then the environment's selecting for you to show that disease. But all of this based in our genes. Heritable. 
Mutations actually are a good thing because it allows for variation in the population. So if you remember the owls from last lecture, you had the owl that was like black and white and you had the owl that was brown and black. And in two different scenarios, when there's no, so no snow, the brown and black is favored. But when there is snow, the black and white is favored. So we have two different environmental conditions where you've got two different traits. And the good thing is, is that if you have snow, somebody in your population is favored. And if you don't have snow, somebody in your population is favored. So even though they're pretty different in how they look, the important thing is that you have that variation so that when the environment changes, you can keep going as a population. Variation, mutations lead to variation, which is really, really good. Really, really good. Okay, let's talk about a couple other modes of natural selection. So we have what's called gene flow. When members of different populations come together, new genes can be added to the population or the gene pool. So gene flow means sex between members of different populations. I'm gonna give you an example. So let's say out there on our prairie, we've got our prairie and then we've got 107th and then we've got some other wetland over there. And let's say that the cars prevent either population, the population here in our prairie or the population on the other side of 107th, this flow of traffic, it prevents them from trying to cross because they're like, oh, those cars are scary. So they just stay in their own side of the street. But let's say the forest preserves go, we're gonna knock out that street. It's not used as much as 111, and it would be better for the natural populations to have the ability to move across those two different ecosystems. So they block it off. And now, because the cars are gone, you've got members in this population and our prairie can meet up with members of a different population. We get gene flow between the two populations. And let's say on the prairie, that the mice are small and medium, and on the wetland on the other side, that they're medium and large. So we've got two different variations amongst the populations. They're both showing medium, but this one's showing small and that one's showing large. And when they come together, now the new population has more variation because they have small, medium, and large traits. So genes, new genes can flow into a population when members of another population meets up with them. Adding more genes makes them become more similar. If we separate them, they would become different. All right, so this is the idea of gene flow. Gene flow is one issue that can allow us to have more variation in population or could be less as well if we take away gene flow. Let's talk a little bit about genetic drift, that the genes of the population are changing because some members of that population are going to kind of like drift away to another area. If the population is really, really big and a small amount of members of that population go and establish themselves somewhere else, probably not a big deal, but if you have a really small population and the members that leave take away half of your variation of your population, that could be really bad. So for, gene, for genetic drift, big populations don't suffer as much of losing variability as small populations do. So for example, we have this little population, we've got 20, individuals in our population. And what they're showing here is they're showing the percentage or they're showing all of the genotypes. The genotypes are the two alleles that you have from your biological mom and dad. They've each got two alleles for the trait of fur color. And you have some that are big B, big B, some that are big B, little B, and some that are little B, little B. This is an example of a complete dominance trait. When we're talking about complete dominance, there are two 
what we call phenotypes or physical expressions of the trait. Our physical expressions are having dark fur or light fur. The dark fur, the big B, big B codes for dark fur, little b codes for light fur. The big B, the dominant allele, and the presence of the recessive allele, so when you have these here, for what we call heterozygous, because they have two different alleles, when you have two different alleles, a heterozygous individual, the big B masks or hides the presence of the little b. So when you have a big B, even though little b is here, it's kind of like just hiding it. Notice that individuals who we call homozygous dominant, two of the same alleles, big B, big B, that they look exactly the same. They have the same phenotype as the big B, little b. So when you have a heterozygous individual and they have the dominant allele, they look the same as if someone had two dominant alleles. They're just hiding. There's no expression of the recessive allele in the presence of the dominant allele. It's hidden. The only way you see the recessive trait is when you have individuals with the genotype little b, little b, coding for two recessive alleles. Nothing is masking them. They can show their actual trait. They can express the recessive trait. So in our population, let's say something disastrous happens. There's a big fire in the area where they live, and the only two that survive in this population are a heterozygous individual and a homozygous recessive. So when we take a look at their, and then, and then they, you got the two of them, and they're like, all right, well, we're the only two left. Let's make, get some more in this population again. So you have a, an individual know anything about Punnett squares, I'm sure it's ringing a bell for you all, is that you put one individual on the top, uh, typically you'll put the males on the top and the females on the side. What you're going to do with these genes is you're going to take these genes and you're going to put them straight down, and these genes go straight down, these genes go across, and these genes go across. So that when we fill in our Punnett square, I'm going to put big B down, big B down, this little B, I'm going to put this down, I always put the little or recessive traits in the back in case a dominant trait comes along. Our brains just like to look at, remember that this means the same thing as that. This is still masked in the presence of that, but if you write it like that, your brain might go, that masks that. So this individual looks like that. It's a funny trick that your brain plays on you. So genetics, I like to keep things very organized because our brains just do weird things sometimes. All right, so big B down, little B down. We're gonna put little B across, and we're gonna put little B across. When we take a look at the frequency of individuals in our population now, what we're finding is that we're finding we have half and half, and that's what we're showing there, is that your offspring are half big B, little B, and half little B, little B. Oh man, this poor population, something happens again, and everybody dies except for two individuals, and in this case, generation two, the only two that survive are little b, little b, and little b, little b. Just thinking logically, is there the possibility that a big b could be in the next generation? No, the big b's got wiped out, right? So, now, What we end up is, we end up with our third generation being exactly the same. And so this is a form of what we call genetic drift, is that the genes in three generations have drifted in a totally different way than what we have in our first generation. All right, what causes genetic drift? There's two causes of genetic drift. One is the population bottleneck, and the other one is called the founder effect. Okay, 
bottleneck. So first we're gonna talk about the population bottleneck. The bottleneck is caused by a catastrophe or something like what we just saw in our example that the majority of the population, bam, is wiped out and you're only left with a few individuals. So it could be like a hurricane, an earthquake, a tsunami. Something like really, really, really bad that happens. Because of this, we see a complete reduction in individuals in the population and a complete reduction in the variation of genes. We've wiped out the majority of our gene pool. is very destructive to a population in terms of their variation or their diversity. All right, so let's just say that this is representing four different alleles that we see in our gene pool and our population. You've got quite a lot of individuals and something happens where only nine individuals survive. And of those nine individuals that survive, you're only ending up with half of your variation. We lose what would cause this to only allow these to survive? What we're losing is we're losing red and green in our population. Over time, you're gonna end up with half the variation in your population because something really, really bad happened there. The northern elephant seals. In the 1800s, they almost went extinct from overhunting. By 1890s, 100, almost 100 years later, only 20 individuals survived. Now, what they're hunting for is they're hunting for specific traits, right? They want probably the biggest ones, the ones that make the biggest offspring, so they have more meat to eat, and they also can use the fat or the blubber in the 1800s, use it to light lamps, use it for like kerosene to light up lamps. So they want the really, really big ones. And so then they're left with like 20 of the more maybe like scrawny little ones. They all end up because that big size was selected for by the humans playing the agents of natural selection that the little scrawny ones are going to reproduce together. And then what we find today is that because of this genetic drift, population bottleneck, that they're almost all genetically related. What if a disease comes along and they have the genes for predisposition to getting that disease in a certain environment? They're gone. So population bottleneck genetic drift is really, really bad, and here's an example. All right, let's talk about the founder effect kind of genetic drift. Oops, sorry. So founder effect is when you have a big population and a small group of those individuals leave and they make the population somewhere else. They're like, we're out of here. Maybe it got too crowded. Maybe they just didn't get along. Resources are tight, lots of competition. This can happen pretty often when a population gets really big, is that it gets uncomfortable, survival gets hard, and individuals are like, let's go somewhere else. Let's found, find a population in another area. Now, if the population I mean, the chances of those individuals who are not surviving well all having a big variety of genes, probably not gonna happen because the advantageous traits, I'm gonna guess that they don't have the most advantageous traits in that environment, they're having a hard time surviving. So they're probably pretty similar. And then they go and they take their similarities and less variation than the big population somewhere else. So now this new population is gonna have very limited variation. their gene pool is gonna be really, really, really different than the main gene pool. They're gonna very, very, very likely be far less diverse. There's a lot of forethought and they're like let's pick one individual of every trait and then let's go and start a new population that'd be great but usually it's just based on survival if they're not surviving well then nobody cares they're like let's get out of here so 
So there's the Amish, Amish population um, in the United States, and because they left and they formed their own kind of like population society, they have a high chance of having Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, which um, some of it is just like, well, one thing is that they have an extra finger, which actually I think is like a really advantageous trait, right? If you had another finger to grasp stuff or playing the piano, there's some advantages to having more than one finger, uh, more than one, more than five fingers. So that's kind of like a good trait that they have, but then they have this disease that is very uh, debilitating as well. Let's talk about the idea of an equilibrium population. When we're talking about an equilibrium population, what that means is it means that evolution is not happening. Do you think that an equilibrium population where evolution is never happening can exist? No, right? In the least, we're gonna look at some of the characteristics. In the least, mutations always happen. Mistakes are always made. So you can't control that, right? We already said over and over and over again that you can't will your genes to have certain mutations or not have certain mutations. So equilibrium populations, they don't exist. You're never gonna see a state where all the variation stays exactly the same, where the gene pool stays the same over time. There are certain criteria that have to be met in order for this to happen. Meaning that no evolution means no change. And if we actually could have an equilibrium population, all Every one of these has to be met. So one is there has to be no mutation. And we're going to be like, nah. Mm -hmm. Equilibrium populations wouldn't share genes with other populations. No gene flow. Population would have to be really, really, really big so that changes wouldn't really affect them. All mating would have to be random and everybody would have to mate, but most natural populations choose mates based on advantageous genes. It's not random. Right, just like you, you might like choose a person for certain reasons. If somebody said to you, nope, you're gonna mate with this one and you're gonna mate with that one, you're gonna mate with that one. Most populations don't do that. No natural selection. Nobody is favored by their genes in the population given the current environment. So no way. But if we were going to have an equilibrium population, all of this would have to be met. Let's take a look at, we're gonna skip ahead to, uh, it's not gonna write there. We're gonna skip ahead to talking about Hardy Weinberg. All right, so here's, we're gonna take a look at equilibrium, I mean, excuse me, we're gonna take a look at allele frequencies over time. This only works with complete dominant traits. When we're talking about our traits as humans, our traits are super complicated. There's usually not, one set of genes for a trait. Usually you have all kinds of genes that this gene shows this and this gene shows this and this one here and this one there and this one here and then they work together and they make a trait. So like for example, height. Um, I am 5'7". In my family, everybody is taller than six feet. So like in the world, people will say, oh, you're really tall. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm so short. But then people who are like five foot are like, no, you're tall. You know, so that's you know, kind of funny. But in my family, I am the shortest one. I am short by far. Everybody's like super big. Uh, the way that height works is height works by a very big combination of many genes code for this. And you might have, and let's say that there's 30 genes that code for the trait of height and one of those 30 genes is a complete dominant trait, but that's one of a lot that work together to make this total trait. Uh, handedness is still believed to be one, one pair of genes to code for one trait, but we might find that's not true in the future. So complete dominance, again, dominant allele masks the presence of the recessive allele. The only way that you see the recessive allele Excuse me, the only way that you see the recessive trait is when you have two recessive alleles, then you see the recessive trait, otherwise masked. Hardy-Weinberg, we can use two equations to show that evolution is happening over time. 
using mathematics. I love math. For those of you who are brainwashed into thinking, I don't like math or I'm bad at math, that's because people in the world constantly say that. And then you pick up with that and you incorporate that into your psyche. We do math like probably at least 20 times a day, not even realizing. We're all good at math. We are. We just like been told over time, math is hard and I don't like math. So tell yourself you like math. There's actually a psychological study that said with parents of children, if you tell your kid that they're good at math at an early age, they will like math and be good at it. That's what I did with my son. Guess what his favorite subject is? Math and science. Anyway. All right, so the two equations, you have one that codes for genotypes. There's two genes and a genotype. So two genes make up a genotype. An allele is one gene. You got one or the other, the different versions of that gene. Your genotypes, if we're talking about, let's say we're talking about height in plants. Um, there are some plants that have two alleles code for the height trait. In humans, we don't work that way. So you could have homozygous dominant, capital T, capital T, heterozygous, big T, little t, or homozygous recessive, little t, little t. Those are your genotypes. So make sure you get this in your head, because this is really important, that you know a genotype is made up of two genes, an allele is one gene. All right, so let's talk about these P's and Q's. We got P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. We got P plus Q equals one. P squared. P squared is the frequency or percentage of the homozygous dominant genotype. When you're talking about the first equation, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, as I mentioned before, those refer to the genotypes. We're looking at two genes. What two genes did you inherit from biological mom and biological dad? Okay, so big T, big T, homozygous dominant is p squared. Individuals who show homozygous dominant or big T, big T, the phenotype that they show, the physical expression of the genotype is going to be the dominant trait. If we're talking about this as height, they're gonna be tall. All right, so that's P squared. Let's take a look at Q, 2PQ. 2PQ, the frequency of the heterozygous, heterozygous, because you have one of each kind of allele or two different alleles, Heterozygous is big T, little t, two different alleles for your two PQs. These individuals still look dominant. The big T masks the presence of the little t. They look as the homozygous dominant do. They look the same. They're both tall. This one is not a mix of tall and short. Short G is masked. And then Q squared, we call that homozygous, two of the same, little t, little t, but recessive. We have two of the same recessive genes. So again, remember homozygous is two of the same. If it's little t, little t, it's homozygous recessive. Big T, big T, homozygous dominant. This is the only phenotype that is going to show the recessive trait. is the frequency or percentage of the dominant allele. Remember, an allele is one gene.
Here's the frequency of the recessive allele, little t. Percentage of one gene, little t. So as I said before, we can use these equations to take a look at these two equations, what are the percentages of P, Q, P squared, 2P, Q, and Q squared, and write that down, come back 10, 30, 100,000 generations later, calculate this all out again, take our data again, see if we have any changes, and if we do, it's evidence to show that evolution has happened in that population. So pretty cool, we can directly use our genetics. We're going to take a look at an example. In our population, 16% of our population shows the recessive phenotype or trait. They show little t, little t. Little t, little t is q squared. So we can start out with our little t, little t, q squared, 0.16. And we're going to stick that, this is what our Punnett square is going to look like, is we're going to put p squared here, pq, pq, and q squared. Why we have two pqs is because we've got one, two pqs. So this, you're going to add up what's here and here together. Okay, so 0.16, we've got that. We can use this data to get us what our Q is by taking the square root of Q squared. Oh, I told you in there. All right, so I answered this. All right, so 0.16 is a decimal represents, oh no, sorry, 0.16 is a decimal represents Q squared. So as I said here, sorry. 0.16 Q squared, little t, little t. Well, did the question say that it needs to be recessive? So we were told, when we go back, we were told that 0.16 was our little t, little t originally. Okay. Okay, so now we know Q squared is 0.16. If we know Q squared is 0.16, what we can do is we can take 0.16 and do the square root of it, and it'll give us Q, and we're going to put Q here and here. So when you take the square root of 0.16, Q is 0.4. As I'm doing this, I'm filling in what I know at the bottom, too. Now, we have two equations that we're working with. This one, we only need one more factor. We have P plus Q equals 1. We can change that by moving that here and subtracting it so that P is 1 minus Q. So the answer is B, I'm going past to this. So in this question, we're going to rearrange this equation. P plus Q equals 1. We know we can move the Q over, but then we have to subtract it on the other side. So P, when we take P equals 1 minus 0.4, our Q, we get P is 0.6. So now here on my Punnett square, I know P, I know Q, and I know Q squared. 
when we're looking at conic squares, remember that you are going to take this and put it down, this across, this down, this across, down, across. So now we can just calculate the rest out. Because we have P and Q, we can figure out P squared and our two PQs. So P squared right here, remember we're taking 0.6, and 0.6, so you take 0.6 times 0.6, which is 0.36. Now we only have to figure out 2PQ. So what you're doing for 2PQ is you're taking your P, 0.6, times your Q, 0.4. For each PQ, you're doing that. So 0.6 times 0.4. What's 0.6 times 0.4? 0.24. Okay, so we know this is 0.24, and this is 0.24. Two, we have two of them. So you're going to add 0.24 and add 0.24. Your two PQs equal what? 0.48. Good. So I know this is like students are like, why? Where'd you get the two PQs from? You got one here and one here. Two of them. So you add up 0.24 and 0.24, and that gives us 0.48. All right. Here's the thing about Hardy Weinberg. What do each of these equations add up to? One, right? So we can check our work. So both of our equations tell us that our P plus Q have to equal one, and all of these inside have to equal one. So let's check our work. Does 0 0.6, 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 equal one? If I add up 0.36 plus 0.48 plus 0.16, I get one. Now, when we're working, I purposely did this so it would perfectly be one. If in lab we're going to take our data for three traits as a class, you may get like 0.99 or 0.98. It might not be exactly one, or you might get 1.01 or 1.02. As long as it's really close to one, don't worry about it. This is fake data. All right, so what does that have to do with evolution? We can look at allele frequencies now. We can look in the future. If we have changes, woo, evolution. I'm gonna go over this again in lab after y'all take your data. So last thing, evolution. Evolution is a change in the genes or the allele frequencies over time. And that's Cardi Weinberg. So today what we're going to do, um, why don't you take a break, take like 10 minutes, Use restroom, get something to drink. Um, and then at like 25 till, I, I, when, it, when it's on the 7, I will um, we'll take our data in the lab and then we'll do another example of this.